questions. If you don't have a sermon outline, please just lift your hand, and uh, these kind gentlemen will be glad to give you one. Again, we come to our study of the book of Hosea, and the subtitle of this study is God's Scandalous Love, God's Scandalous Love for and His Unfaithful People. And um, so take out your outline there, take out your Bible, and turn with me back there to the book of Hosea, there toward um, the end of your New Testament as we come again to this great study. Uh, many of you have been commenting about things that you've been learning in this, and I want us to recap that just a little bit this morning. Um, I, I have been enjoying the depth of God's Word and His love as shown in this. Um, this morning we come to uh, chapter 3, and uh, I want you to see chapter 3 with me. I'm going to go ahead and read chapter 3, and then we will review a little bit. Look what it says in chapter 3 and verse 1. This is in the box on your page or on the screen in front of you. And the Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they, turn their, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. We're going to see what that means. Verse 2, so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lek of barley. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. Verse 4, for the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. Afterward, the children of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall come in fear to the Lord, and underline it, and to his goodness in the latter days." We see over and over again in the message of Hosea, God calling his people out of their unfaithfulness back to himself. And here this morning, we come to see how he buys us back from ourselves. Well, we've said in our review, and I, I just want you to notice a few things here, and this could be very important, especially if you're new to us, you haven't sure where we've been, um, this will bring you up to speed just a little bit, but to those who have been here, this review is more, it's more application-oriented. It's, it's not so much the details of what we've studied in the facts, though a little bit, it's more, I want you to get out of this and be reminded out of this, the last three messages and what their impact has been on us a little bit. The first thing that we see in this is that Hosea is worth our attention. The book of Hosea is worth our attention. In this present day and time, we often will not, will not have sermons or series out of Old Testament passages that may be a little bit difficult to understand or may be a little thick or a little bit hard, but this one demands our attention. This one deserves our attention um, as all scripture does, but here we see this in living color, that this has great application to us. And it's not only worth our attention, it's worth our time. When you study the Bible, it takes a little bit of time to go back and to read and to study and to look at what is here, to meditate on what is being said in order to understand what is here. And it's interesting how if we spend a little bit of time and we give it our attention, that there are many jewels and gems that can be mined out of the rough that is here. And so that brings me to the third one is, it is worth our effort. It is worth your effort to think and try to remember and to put together some of the things, not only in this message, but also as you're reading the Bible. It is worth the time that you would look and see what the eternal creator of the universe is saying to you through his word. And so our attention, our time, and our effort. Look at the next one, number two. Hosea reveals two great extremes. And the first extreme is this, the extreme sinfulness of God's people. Put out there in brackets, not, or not, not the bracket there on the right, but just above God's people. You know, not pagans. This isn't about the pagans that don't know God. This is about the sinfulness of God's people. The nation of Israel that had been so disobedient. And let me just say that this is about our hearts. This is about our hearts that so often can run away to other things other than God. It's not only about the extreme sinfulness of God's people, but it's also about this extreme, fill this in, faithfulness 
of God's love. In this we find the great hope, the faithfulness of God's love. Um, I want to encourage you to just, just remember with me that, yes, indeed, we see Gomer in Israel representing. We saw this. This is on the screen in front of you. Let's read those three words underneath Gomer in Israel. What, what did we see there? They were unfaithful, running away, and what? That's what Gomer was doing. The wife of Hosea was, was unfaithful to him, and she's running away, and she's letting go of him. But on the other side, we see Hosea in representing God's loving heart. And what, what do we see there? We see God's faithful, his running after, and holding fast. Um, indeed, this is the picture. So you can put out there to the side, Homer or Gomer and Hosea, sinfulness of God's people, Gomer, faithfulness of God's love is represented by Hosea. In fact, our graphic... Um, for this series where it says Hosea. Behind that, you see one arm holding on to another arm as if the other arm is seeking to flee away. And this is the idea that we see in Homer's, or in Gomer's life that um, she is seeking to leave the one who has come to love her and to care for her. And so this is what the great picture of God's love is for us, that we are tempted to run away, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. That is the picture of Hosea. Number three, we've said that Hosea's base message, the base obvious message is, you have been unfaithful to God, but he will be faithful to you. You've been unfaithful to God, but he will be faithful to you. This is the amazing, scandalous love of God. Notice the next part, number four. Hosea's ultimate truth, though, we see this. Is if we get down and we peel back through it and we think about it, we start to see that salvation is only by God's loving, merciful grace. We hear a lot of judgment in Hosea. We hear a lot of prosecution of that which they have done wrong, but we come to see that all of that accusation that God is making against his unfaithful people is to help them see their wrong and to be pulled back to what is right. And so this is a, a key issue for us. Look at there at the bottom there underneath that. Over a hundred times we see God speak in the first person. He's saying, I will, I will, I have done this, I commend on this. These are the things over and over again. Even last Sunday, as we looked through it, we see in verses 6 through 13, in love, he blocks her path, he thwarts her efforts, he provides for her, he cuts off her supplies, he kills her partying, he takes away her prosperity, and then he punishes these things. And what is he doing all that for? so that she would come back to him and love him and care for him. It's in love that he does each one of those things. And then he says, behold, I will take the gods of Baal out of their mouths, the people of Israel. I will put my word into their mouths. So a hundred times we see that God is the active mover in this. In chapter one, we see the scandalous story overview. Chapter one is pretty short. It's only 11 verses. Um, and in that 11 verses, we see this shocking story begin. And the shocking story is, is that Hosea, the prophet of God, the good and, and prophet, a, a true prophet, is commanded to marry a promiscuous woman. He marries Gomer. And then Gomer bears Hosea a son, and he names him Jezreel. And then in verses 6 through 7, Gomer bears an illegitimate daughter. So she goes off with other men, and she bears um, a, a daughter that's not Hosea's. And this is a picture of, of Israel's unfaithfulness to God. And God says, no mercy. Because of this, there is no mercy for you. This is a, a living example of their apostasy. 8 through 9, an illegitimate son. God says, name him, not my people. And this picture of no mercy and not people is the coming judgment of God because of their unfaithfulness to him. But then, in verses 10 through 11, we see this shocking thing. 
Look what it says there in verses 10 through 11. God shockingly renews his covenant with Israel. And so even after all of their unfaithfulness is described and declared and even shown in this living illustration of the prophet's family, God says, I'm going to love you. I'm going to love you, and I'm going to care for you, and I'm going to bring you to myself. Chapter 2, that's just the overview. In chapter 2, we see it in vivid detail, and so fill that in. The scandalous story details. And um, verses 1 through 2, God calls his people to repent. He's saying, turn back to me and come and know me and walk with me. In verse 3 through 5, God threatens to expose and condemn his unfaithful people. Verses 6 through 13, this is that long section that was so beautiful last Sunday as we were just looking at how he says, in love he goes, in love he goes and brings her back to him. In love he provides for her even when she's being an adulteress. And here we see in 14 through 23 is the glorious picture of God's grace and power sovereignly restores his people to himself. It's not even that they come to themselves and start to realize, oh, wow, we've gone away from God. It is God's power and his glory that comes upon their hearts, and he shows them their need to turn to him in worship, and he puts worship into their mouths. Well, Chapter 3 is what we study today. That's why that long line is there, the separation. I want us to see a few things in chapter 3 that I believe will help us greatly as we understand the rest of the book of Hosea. So chapters 1, 2, and 3 set up the next 11 chapters. The next 11 chapters will move much faster. They are an outcome of chapters 1 through 3. But notice with me chapter 3. Today we come and we look at the scandalous story outcome. This is, this is where the story goes. So at first, Hosea is told in chapter 1 to go marry this promiscuous woman, and she goes out and has children, even from other people, and we see all of the judgment on that in chapter 2, but we still see this repeated statement that God is going to bring them back. In chapter 3, the story gets even more scandalous. Look what it says in verse 1. In chapter Uh, chapter 3 and verse 1 at the top of the page it says and the Lord said to me go again love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress even as the Lord loves the children of Israel though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisin now this is seems to be and just fill it in for the third time we see a seemingly unthinkable command from God to Hosea. Hosea is told, go and love your wife that has run away. And she is now living as a repeated, proved adulteress. She is living away from you. She has run away from you. And we see Hosea is commanded, go and get her and love her. This is Gomer. Some would say, well, it seems to be a little bit confusing there. Go again, love a woman. It doesn't say love your wife. Why would it say that? Well, first of all, it can mean that, and it can say that in the Hebrew in the way this would be constructed. But it is completely confirmed that this is talking about Gomer because of the next line. Look what it says. Go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and adulteress. And then here is the key, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel. So throughout this story and throughout the story of Hosea's life, the picture of his marriage to Gomer is the picture of God's marriage to the nation of Israel. And they keep being unfaithful. Now when Israel was unfaithful to God, God didn't go to the Philistines and make them his children. He didn't go to another nation. He stayed with Israel. And so here's the picture here, is that the illustration stands. Notice this in the small type there. Because God didn't switch nations after Israel was unfaithful to him. This is Gomer. Notice the next part. And at this point, in the first chapter, we see that she's just a promiscuous woman. It doesn't say that she was a prostitute. There's many people who have often said, and as they interpret 
um, uh, Hosea chapter 1, that he's told to go and marry a prostitute. That is not the words that are used in the Hebrew language. There are specific words for a prostitute. That is not the word. But it is the word that she is promiscuous. It is the word that she is someone who seems to be sexually oriented in a deviant way. She is one who seems to be unruly in this. And so, and, and so this is part of the scandal. This is what you say, why would he do that? Because God is making a point through a Hosea and even his own life and his marriage and his children so the nation of Israel can look and see what God is saying to them. So, you know, we need illustrations so often in life, and the illustration helps us understand what is going on. And here is an illustration of that that is so vivid. And so now we see, the second bullet point there is, that she is clearly an adulteress. It's a proven fact now. He knows she's wicked, and she knows she's wicked. Everyone knows she's wicked. Everyone knows that she has a husband. She even has a child with that husband and two other children that he has brought into his family from her other relationships, and now she's gone again, and now she's living with someone else. And Hosea is told to go and be reunited with her. Now, this is just scandalous. This is just, this, this seems crazy to us. Who is going to go and, and seek to make her come home after all of this? Notice that this illustration is for us that this is Israel. This is Israel. This is what they did. They turned to other gods and love cakes of raisins. You say, what in the world does that mean, love cakes of raisins? Well, it is believed that, that was part of a Canaanite, idolatrous, sexual cultish ceremony. And so the picture of that is the other Canaanite gods that are around them, um, they're in the land of Canaan, they're in Israel. We start to see that they have been affected by that, that they've started worshiping these pagan gods. And many of those pagan gods had very sexual practices around their ceremonies. You know, Satan always loves to distort the things that God says is so right. That's why he distorts our sexuality. He always wants to turn and twist it and make it from not about the other person and loving someone intimately, but make it all about yourself. That's what pornography does. That is what all kinds of other sexual, going after all of the sexual things in our culture. It's all about me. It's all about making me happy. It's all about my experience. But what we start to see is that, that God has made us fundamentally to be different than that. His love is an other-oriented love. God's love in its purity is designed to serve and to care and to love others, not to love self. And so Satan loves to come and deceive people and cause them to turn the good things of God on their head. And that's exactly what he does, not only with their religious worship, but even their sexuality. And this is just, it is as if it's given God the finger. I mean, it's as if it's just absolutely cursing God in the way that they live. And so this is full-blown, sexually explicit, idolatrous, idolatrous worship. That's what this is. Now, if you didn't think that Israel had religious problems before, I hope you understand that they did now. And before we are too hard on them, before we are so judgmental on them, over and over again during our study of Hosea, we should be asking ourselves, Lord, how do I do that too? Because you remember with me that God looks upon the heart. We see this throughout the scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, that the issue is always our hearts before God. And very often, you can look squeaky clean on the outside, and God is saying, what is the condition of your heart? And the issue of the heart is what God is after in this. And so we see that God is calling them back to himself, but we see that Hosea is called to go and to love this woman as an example of what he does with an eminently unfaithful nation that is supposed to be his. Flip the sheet over and notice here with me verse 2. In verse 2, we see Hosea's sacrificial payment 
for Gomer. And let me tell you, this verse two seems so simple and so basic, but I have found it to be so profound. And I'm gonna show you some things here that I think may blow you away. Look at verse two and what it says. So Hosea does what the Lord tells him to do. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a leketh of barley. You say, what in the world does that mean? Well, let me just tell you that this was a sacrificial payment. You say, why was it a sacrificial payment? Look at the first one. First of all, Hosea goes and buys Gomer out of her self-induced slavery. Her self you see, she kept running out after this. She kept making a mess. She kept, not only would she go and sleep with other people, but she would wind up owing them. She would wind up, she, whatever she was doing was so wicked that she even had debts that came about as part of this. And even after Hosea was coming and bringing her supplies and bringing her the things that she, that she could live, she still winds up into slavery and owing her life to someone else because of her debts. And so here she is, a repeated adulteress, sold herself basically into slavery, and she has this self-induced prison because of her own wickedness. And Hosea is going to go buy her back. He's going to go pay money to get her back after all of her rejection of him. And notice this, and this is part of what what I really see in verse 2 that's amazing. Hosea gives everything he has to get her back. You say, well, what's the indication of that? How does he give everything he has? Well, the, the price for a slave, we see this in Exodus, the price to bring someone out of their debt was 30 shekels of silver. Well, Jose didn't apparently have 30 shekels of silver. And so he, he had 15 shekels of silver. That symbol that's there in front of 15 is a symbol for a shekel. That's like a dollar sign, but it's a shekel. So he gives 15 shekels of silver plus what would be equivalent of three 55-gallon barrels of grain. And so he says, okay, I'm going to give you all the cash I have, and I'm going to give you grain. And so he, Jose, this is wiping him out. How much does he love Gomer? How much does he love obedience to God? This is wiping him out. He's coming to his adulterous wife, and he, he's just cashing it all in in order to get her out. You see, a homer is approximately 100-gallon capacity. A leka is approximately half of a homer, so that's about 150 gallons. So I want you to imagine this. This is like three 55-gallon barrels of barley. So this, this is a lot. Now, what this tells me is that when he went down to buy her, it's very public. Write that out there to the side. It's not only everything he has, but it is very public. He didn't show up with a little money bag and say, hey man, I'm here for uh, Gomer. Uh, you know, can we do this quietly? Can we, whatever. Here, here's the little bag of 30 shekels and just give me Gomer back and uh, you know, I'll take her home. It's not like that. He, apparently, it's public. Everybody knows. You can't hide that he's going to do that. I mean, okay, so Hosea doesn't, everybody knows. Hosea, he's spending it all to get his wife back. This is a scandal. And not only is he spending it all to get his wife back, but I mean, he's bringing out, I mean, you can't hide 150 gallons worth of barley being paid. You know, people talk, especially in those days and times when everybody kind of knew what all was going on. It, it, it was very public. Now, I want you to think about this in relationship to Christ. When God comes to buy his unfaithful people from their own sin, he holds back nothing on the price. He gives it all. He gives himself. And he gives himself, not just to work for a little while, but he gives himself unto death and so and he does that publicly 
He dies publicly. Jesus wasn't executed in a small courtyard in a Roman uh, office or in some type of a, of a Jewish temple back alley gate where Jesus would give his life. Jesus, the Son of God, creator of the universe, is held up on a cross outside of the capital of, of Israel in Jerusalem. And here he is nailed on a cross for the whole world to mock and ridicule and say, look at that. It was very public what God did in pain for our sins. So I, I just never read verse 2 the same again. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and all of this barley. It was everything he had, and it was public. Notice number 3. Hosea is reunited to be pure but not sexually intimate. You say, what in the world does that mean? He is reunited with her to be pure, but not sexually intimate. Look at verse three, it says, and I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. So the idea is I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be celibate with you. And the picture is this. There's, a, there's an imagery here. There's a reason that God would have it go this way, and the imagery for Israel is this. She is specifically commanded that she must not go out and play the whore. So, so that has got to come to an end. That's got to stop. It's part of the picture that God's not just winking at her sin and says, go ahead, keep sinning because I love to forgive. You can just keep sinning. I love to forgive. That, that is not the picture. You see, there's some people who come to Christ and say, wow, this is a good deal. Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He loves to forgive, and I love to sin, so we have a good deal. Some people, I mean, seriously, in cultural Christianity, there's some people that think that that's okay. Well, I said the prayer. I filled out the car. Somebody got me wet in the tank, and so I must be good and, you know, so I've got these things that I can't seem to control. You know, I'm this ethnicity or I'm that, so we're always like this or we're always like that or whatever it is. There's some people that just make excuses for all kinds of things, whether they're white or black or Hispanic or Russian or what, whatever it is. We, we make these excuses and we say it's all okay because God loves to forgive and I love to sin. So, you know, we, we forget Romans chapter 6. It says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And the, what is the response to that? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin continue therein? So the true Christian comes to see that God is saying, stop your whoredom. Stop going out and worshiping American, American I was about to say American idols. But I mean, yeah, <laughs> American idols. Wow. Oh. Culture makes it hard sometimes. <laughs> no, but think about it. We so often, we, we, we go off and we worship the things around us. And whether you live in America in 2019 or whether you live in, in France in 1500 or whether you live in Gaul or whether you live in China or whether, wherever you live, we are human beings that are prone to worship something. And God is saying, come and worship me. And when he calls us to himself and when he names us as his own, he's saying, come and stop your whoredom. There are some people that because, because of Hosea and seeing the deep love of God that even goes beyond that, you're going to stop going out after other sins because you begin to see how much God loves you. You know, love is the greatest motivator. It's, it's, it is the, the greatest motivator for us to see. You, you know, it was, it was in love that Christ came. We love because he first loved us. And so I just want you to see the enormous love of God. And when we have to work through Hosea a little bit, we have to work through barley and cakes of raisins, and we have to work through the hard things. And you're going to name your kid that? Why would God have that? You're going you're gonna to just stay with it and keep looking. And as we keep seeing it, we keep seeing the beautiful, glorious gospel of God's love and his righteousness and his goodness rising to the top over and over and over again. And we can look at it and we can go, wow, this is a God who truly loves. 
So notice this, that this will lead her to purification, rededication, and renewal. That's what God is going to do with the nation of Israel. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. And it was hard for the nation of Israel. We're about to read how, how hard it really got for them. And, and we go and we can look in 1 Kings. We can look in 2 Kings. We can go look in Chronicles. We can go look in, in Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah. And we can see how hard that it became at different points. But God had a plan. You know, and you just make a note out there. For us today as Christians, sanctification, this thing of continuing to walk in Christ as a Christian, it's not easy. It's hard. In Hebrews, God's word tells us, no discipline for the moment seems to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Sanctification, walking with Christ in this life, it's not easy. It is a hard thing to do. Timothy, we are told that all who are godly in Christ Jesus are going to suffer hardship. And so if you're saying, well, I would like to live the Christian life, but apparently I don't know how to do it. Things just seem so hard. No, that may mean you're doing perfectly well. You're right on track because it's hard. And we see that the nation of Israel was being called back to worship and walk with God. And it was going to go through a time of difficulty. Look at verse 4. In verse, verse 4, we see that so the illustration, because Hosea goes and is remarried to her, but uh, remains celibate from her in, in their marriage, so the illustration is brought home to God's people, Israel. And I want you to see this. Look at verse 4 with me and let's read it. Look what it says. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. And so there's this picture that they're going to dwell many days and they're, not, they're likely not going to be in their land, but even if they are in their land, they're not going to have their own king and their own leader. And they're not going to have either the sacrifices, whether to a pagan god or to their proper god, they're not going to have sacrifices, they're not going to have idolatrous pillars, they're not going to have an ephod, the breastplate of righteousness by the, by the priest, um, if indeed that, that is what that is referring to, or their household gods that have become commonplace. What, what he's saying is, is that I'm going to so pressure you that you're not going to be able to worship other gods, and you're not going to even be able to worship me in the way that I have called you to by the ceremonial system. And so God is bringing pressure on them. Look what it says. They must be faithful to God with no pagan idolatry. And look at the next bullet point. They are going to go through a very hard time of exile and captivity. There's going to be no leadership. There's going to be no temple, no sacrifices, no ceremonies, no idols. The Assyrians are coming to crush their independence. And the Assyrians are coming to crush their independence both as a Jewish nation and in the process, listen to this, they are going to crush their independence from God. They're going to make the nation see that they need God. And so, that's all going to happen as we come up on verse 5, and look what it says here in verse 5. Hope is promised. So this is looking pretty rough at first. We're looking, we're looking at God is going to come and put you through the grinder in order to help get your attention. And in verse 5, hope is promised. They will, in fact, return to their God and Messiah King. Now that part, Messiah King, is very important because it's in verse 5 that we start to see the pictures of coming Jesus. The picture that their hope is going to be in the sacrifice of God for their sins. Not themselves and not their work, not their religiosity, and not even their keeping the law, but ultimately the righteous king is going to come through David's line this is one of those prophetic passages. Throughout the Old Testament, we see references to the fact that salvation is from God. Salvation comes through the promised Messiah. Um, in Isaiah 55, in fact, we just read that as the opening part of our, of our message this morning. And we're going to see Jeremiah 23, Ezekiel 34, so powerfully picturing the coming Messiah King. 
And Jesus even deals with this with the uh, Pharisees, and he asks them, why did David say that he is submitting to, to the Lord? And the picture is, is that this Lord David is actually submitting to the king of Israel, and the king of Israel is, in fact, the Messiah king that will come and set us free. So, fill this in and note, notice this. These prophetic passages we see, in these prophetic passages, we see the glorious promise of the Messiah. And I want you to see this in Jeremiah 23, 5 through 6, and this is on your outline. It's also on the screen that's in front of you. Notice what it says in Jeremiah 23. Verse 5 says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David, underline it, a righteous branch. And notice that that's a capital B, a righteous branch. That is referring to Jesus. I will raise up a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice, and look what it says, and righteousness in the land. You see, he is a righteous, holy king. And then look at verse 6. In his days, Judah, that's the nation to the south, will be saved. And Israel, that's the nation to the north, will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. What does it say? Read that again. The Lord is what? You see, if there's any hope for us to be righteous, it's God. It's Christ. It's not you and all of your, all of your supposed goodness. We don't have it. We can't be good enough for God. It is solely through the righteousness of Christ and through the Messiah King that we can be made holy and ready for heaven. This is what God does. He comes and he brings his righteous truth. And so he is continually... Uh, fill this in if you haven't already. There is the continual call to return to your saving king. This is the continual call. He's saying over and over again, come back to me. Look at verse 5 and just read it again. I want you to see this at the top of the line. It says, afterward the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And they shall come in fear to the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. David has already been dead hundreds of years at this point. The David that he's speaking here is the Davidic king of the Messiah. Jesus is going to come through the line of David. Jesus is going to be born in Bethlehem, the city of David. Jesus is being prophesied that a Messiah king is going to come, and he is the one that is going to make your renewal possible. And so this is the big picture for us today. Man, we are so blessed. We get to read the Old Testament and see how God's progressively revealed plan of salvation is unfolding. You just start in Genesis and you keep moving through it and you just start to see creation fall and then redemption from Genesis 3 on, we see the redemption plan of God being laid out. And it is a beautiful redemption. I want to say to you this morning, if you have not discovered the, redeem, the redeeming love of God, we've been reading about it. It's the kind of love that goes after someone that's unfaithful to him. And unfaithful to him over and over again. And unfaithful to him in a proven way. What should be our response? If you've never received Christ, I would say, you need to receive the one who loves you like this. You need to receive the one, if you hear his voice calling, that is saying, come. Come. Come to me, that you may kind come and find life, and that you may find the bread of life in the living water. And I would say for Christians in this place, maybe you've thought, I've failed the Lord over and over and over again. There, there certainly will be an end to his grace. There will certainly be an end to this. And I would say to you, if you're really his, you're going to hear his voice and continue to run back to him and say, Lord, Lord, have mercy, and Lord, come and rule and reign. And I am on the path of not worshiping other gods. Amen. I want to challenge you. Notice this. Again, 
Hosea's message centers around returning to God our salvation. You see, God is our salvation, and he calls us to continually return to him, to come back to him, not in flagrant disobedience, but in obedience that is motivated by his great love. Would you stand with me for prayer?